Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. I want to say happy Valentine's Day to everybody out there. Happy Valentine's Day. May the Lord bless you. This is our regular weekly message. And today, our message is entitled, Husbands, Love Your Wives. I heard this joke about how a wife told her husband how rude he was for yawning while they were arguing. He responded, I wasn't yawning. I thought it was my turn to talk. And one more joke. A man approached a very beautiful woman in the supermarket and says, You know, I've lost my wife here in the supermarket. Can you talk with me for a few minutes? Why? asked the beautiful woman. To which the man replied, Because every time I talk to a beautiful woman, my wife appears out of nowhere. And now our message. Our message is entitled, Husbands, Love Your Wives. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 33. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let every one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This coming Tuesday, February the 14th, is Valentine's Day 2023. It's the day that we set aside to celebrate love. And I believe that any time we celebrate love, pure love, we celebrate God. Because God is love. And I'm not talking about some perverted love or, or debauchery. I'm talking about pure, unconditional, godly love. That is who God is. God is love. Did you know that love has been studied scientifically? It caught me by surprise as well. I thought, wow, these people would study anything to keep from getting a real job. But I'm only kidding. I'm just joking. But seriously, love has been studied and measured and observed scientifically and in a lab. And they, they found out several things about love scientifically. Apparently, one researcher in particular who studied love, he looked at it scientifically. He examined brain scans. He conducted lab experiments. And he concluded that love is central in human life. It is the biggest predictor of human happiness, more than wealth, even more than success. He found that it's, it's a huge predictor of health even. And, and it, it, it predicts how long you will live. And this can be predicted by the relationship or, or the quality of relationship that you are in. It is even a bigger predictor than longevity than smoking or obesity, according to this, this one scientist. He came up with a 36 questionnaire quiz where he asked 36 different questions to, to a teen 
information about the other one so that it could aid in finding the right mate or the right spouse because it gets people closer by asking questions and finding out intimate things about the other person that you usually wouldn't find out until maybe later on or even years into the marriage. You'd find it out before and it, it, it will facilitate falling in love because when you begin to have things in common, you begin to draw together. So it either brings you together or it expels you apart. It pushes you apart. So it's a good indicator whether or not your relationship will grow and have seen great success with it. Another researcher in goals of, of studying love monitored subjects, heart rate, blood velocity, skin conductance, uh, respiration, facial expression, voice tone, verbal and nonverbal behavior. And you know, they found that shared humor is very powerful in a relationship. Husbands, you need to make your wives laugh. And wives, you need to make your husbands laugh. Shared humor is powerful in a relationship. And it's a two-way street. She makes you laugh. He makes her laugh. So, so you, you make each other laugh and it builds your relationship. You know, those dad jokes are very important to a marriage, whether you realize that or not, they're really important. So don't stop telling your dad jokes, dads. The researcher also found that a ratio of five to one, positive over negative ratio, is the ideal proportion to grow happiness and to grow stable relationships. When there, when there is five times more affection, humor, interest in one another, excitement about each other, connecting to each other, as opposed to hostility, disappointment, anger, and negativity. Your relationship has a 90% better chance of enduring the, chest, the, the test of time. It's 90% better. That means it is nine out of 10 relationships that will last the long haul. Another researcher stated, there's six things that love facilitates. One is health. Two, greater wealth. Three, greater resilience. Faster recovery from illnesses. Five, greater longevity. And six, more successful children. Would you like to live longer? Would you like to live happier? Would you like to live more prosperous? Would you like to have more successful children? Well, fall in love with the right person and work toward that five to one positive over negative relationship and, and build that relationship, build that marriage, nurture that, that, that marriage, and you will achieve these things according to scientific proof. Paul's instructions to us was in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. It starts with the submission of wives to their husbands. This is a very intimate and vulnerable situation that the wife willingly surrenders herself to. I understand that we live in an age when men are becoming obsolete. We don't need men in our lives. But please understand that that is not the plan of God for his people. His plan is the original traditional definition of a nuclear family. One husband and a father. One wife and a mother and their children. One man, one woman. Till life do they part or till death do their part for the whole life. One man, one woman. I know there are many single parent homes out there because of one reason or another, but that is the result of circumstances, not the will of God. And I command 
all of the single parents who are trying to raise a family the best that they can. They're doing their best despite the circumstances of their situations. And I say, the Lord be gracious to you. The Lord give you success in raising your children. May he help you in all ways. I bless you today. You're doing a great job. But the truth is, we need each other. A, a husband needs, a man needs a wife, and a woman needs a husband if they're going to raise a family. Women cannot do without men, and men can definitely not do without a woman. Without a woman, we men are lost. We're like a ship without a captain or a dog without a bone. We need women in our lives. No two ways about it. We need women in our lives, man. We need them. Even God admitted after he created man. You know what? It is not good that man should be alone. He will probably burn the house down trying to cook. Or let one of the children fall off the cliff because he let them get too close to the edge. Now, man needs a woman to round him off completely. And so God created woman. Out of the rib of the man, he created woman. And he gave the woman to the man to be his helpmate. And I have no problem with that. I openly admit, I need my wife in my life. I'm thankful for my wife. I've been married 33 years to the same woman and I'm just as happy, just as pleased now as I was when we first met over 40 years ago. She still makes my heart fitter, fatter. It still goes thump, 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 thump. I still get excited to come home to her. I still love to sit next to her and watch TV and hold hands. I still like, love to romance her. It's been over 33 years, but still, I still love her. I still love being around her. We do everything together. And if she isn't a part of it, I don't want to do it. Because without her, to me, it's not worth doing. If she's not a part of it, I don't want to do it. It's not worth doing. And she feels the same way. Single people, if you're looking for love, don't look for love in all the wrong places. Don't look for love in all these different faces. It's highly unlikely that you will find your one true love, your soulmate, in a bar room. The one that will treat you like a queen. You're not going to find him sitting on a bar stool. It's highly unlikely. So if you want a good spouse, if you want to find a good spouse, look in a good garden. You can't find him in a garbage dump. You don't take advice from people who been married three, four times, and now they think that they have it all figured out. You can't take advice from the Woman Haters Club members. You can't take advice from Men Bashing Society members. God will help you find that perfect mate that he has for you. But don't look in the wrong places for a godly husband. Now, here's something that is really important to, to um, married couples, and especially to you husbands. I'm speaking to you husbands. Husbands, you must never, in no way, shape, or form, betray or take advantage of the trust that your wife puts in you. It is a very valuable and precious thing that a wife would give up in order to make the relationship work according to the scriptures that you both love and believe. When she willingly submits to you, husbands, she puts everything out there. Do not take advantage of that situation. 
And husbands, you are not without obligation. Your responsibility is to love your wife. But not just any old love, not any old kind of love or love your way or love how you want to love, but you have to love as Christ loved the church and gave himself for his church. There is a standard that you have to meet. It's not down here. The standard is way up here. It's a high, high standard. Because this kind of love tells me that us husbands are to love sacrificially. We have to love even when it hurts. Just like Jesus gave himself for the church. We are to love our wives sacrificially. It's our responsibility to keep the fires of love burning at home. See, sometimes we men, we expect women to do all the sacrificing because we provide, so they have to do the sacrificing. But that is not the case. It is us who are called to love sacrificially. We're to love like Christ loved the church and gave himself for his church. When the road of life seems to be taking us uphill, it's an uphill battle, and the struggle is real, and the storms of life beat against that old lean-to. It's not the wife's sole responsibility who must bear all of the burden alone. No, it's a co-op. It's a collective effort to solve mutually difficult and worrying problems. We do it together. We do it as a team. We do it as a couple. It is not good that man should be alone. Neither should the woman be alone. She wasn't even created by herself. She was created for man to be next to the man. Therefore, we are a couple. We do things together. We solve problems together. God said, I will make him a helper fit for him because it's not good that he should be by himself. It's not good that the woman should be by herself. They are one. The two shall become one. We do not face life's raging storms alone. A wife looks to her husband for protection and comfort. She looks to him to feel safe and secure. You don't have to be a prize fighter, man, in order to make your wife feel safe and secure. You don't have to be one of those world championship wrestlers. You don't have to be some massive bodybuilder. You don't have to be a, a, a kung fu fighter. What you have to do is to be there for her. Be a post that she can lean on. Be an anchor in times of trials. You are a team. Let us start acting like a team and cut out all of this D-I-V-O-R-C-E in the church of the living God. Divorce is not his plan for us. Neither is it his plan for our marriages. From the very beginning, it was one man, one woman for life. He meant marriage to last till death do we part. The researcher thought there was three things, or he found that there were three things needed in a relationship to make it grow, to nourish it, to make it strong, to make it stable. One was trust. Two was psychological calm, or physiological calm. And three, commitment. And I want to explain these three topics. The first one, trust. When measured, they found that trust leads to intimacy and great sex. And for men, I could stop right there, but there's so much more. While trust builds intimacy and all that good stuff that goes along with it, distrust, on the other hand, leads to loneliness. Now, I want you to listen to this. They found that the reason why people have extramarital affairs is not because of the sex. It's not because of desire, but rather it is because of loneliness. Loneliness in their marriage. They feel like there's no one there. There's no one to talk to. There's no one to watch TV with. There's no one to pray with. There's no one to go to church with. They're there by themselves. There's no one to help me raise my children. My husband is always gone or he's watching football. He's watching TV by himself. No, 
that leads to loneliness, my friends. They found that the reason why all of that extramarital affairs was loneliness. So husband, please understand this. We might not need to come home and tell our wives all about our day and give a minute by minute review. But you know what? She does. And you better listen before someone else does. It is loneliness, the lack of companionship that causes one spouse to stray and seek pasture in someone else's meadow. So men, understand that women have the need to talk. Even if you're watching football, that does not negate that need. It does not cancel that need. It does not void that need. She still needs your attention. And if need be, if, if, if it's so urgent, turn the football game off. Are they going to hold you at night? Are they going to help you in your marriage? Turn the TV off and listen to your wife. She needs your attention. Her need to talk and tell you all that has been going on is a very strong urge. It's a need. Whereas, men, we don't have that need. But if your wife is talking to you, give her your undivided attention. Don't let her have to repeat herself because you're not listening. Don't let her have to say things over and over. It shows a lack of concern. It shows a lack of love. It's like the woman who came home one day and told her husband, she said, I know the reason why women use twice as many words as men. He said, why? And she replied, because we always have to repeat ourselves. He said, what? Look at it later. There's a, there's a need there. And when there is a need, it must be filled. Now, wives, listen to me. You need to pay attention to those dad jokes. Listen to his times of reminiscence of his younger days, of when he did something really good, or when, when he achieved a goal in his life. Be his biggest cheerleader, but don't go overboard or you will come across as insincere. But pick him up every chance that you get. Stroke his ego a little bit. His ego needs it. It's not because he's egotistic. It's because we need a little encouragement. So encourage us. In a trust relationship, both spouses maximize mutual benefits. You've heard it said that a marriage is a 50-50 relationship. Well, that is the biggest lie ever told. Or one of the biggest lies I ever told. Because they got some big lies out there that people believe. But that is a very big lie. It ranks up there. And that's why we see so, so many divorces. Because listen to me. If you give 50% and she gives 50%, then your marriage or your relationship only has a 50% chance of succeeding. Because in this case, 50 plus 50 does not equal 100. It only equals 50. 50 at best. So what I mean is this. We do not do what the others hate, right? Or, or what they dislike or what, what uh, gets under their skin. We don't get under each other's skin. We try to avoid those types of situations. And we try to do what's pleasing. For instance, wives, when your husband is talking to you or saying something that he deems as important, he needs you to look at him. He needs you to pay attention. He, he don't need you going off doing something else. Look at him. Give him your attention. He needs that. So, so because we're just wired that way. So, on the same token, if your wife hates you taking off your socks, for instance, and just throwing them on the floor, then pick them up. Put them in a laundry basket. Do not do what she hates or what upsets her, what sparks arguments. Stay away from those things. When you have an argument, think about what caused that argument and don't go down that road again. Avoid that road. Avoid arguments. So, 
So we do what pleases each other. I do what pleases her. She do what pleases me. And we are mutually happy. We're always looking to each other for our happiness. And obviously, God is always center. But I'm talking about our relationship between a man and a woman. I'm talking about our marriage relationships. I think about her needs. She thinks about my needs. And then we do our best to fulfill those needs. I, I try to make her happy. Think about what makes her happy. She thinks about what makes me happy. What I like, what I don't like. And we stay away from the don'ts. And we gravitate to the do's. And we do those things. That is maximizing mutual benefits. We do not let the sun go down on our anger. We solve those things. We do not go to bed mad or angry at each other. We talk about it. We work it out. And we let the anger and the hurt go. We'd be like Elsa. Let it go. Let it go. And we will not be men, women. We will not be husbands, wives. We will not be like the couple who vowed to never go to bed angry with each other. And the wife said, so far, we've been up to three days. Don't be like that. Work it out. Number two, physiological calm. The researchers found that when people are calm, they listen better. They're more sympathetic. They are more empathetic. They appreciate humor more. They're, they also found that the spouse could not summarize what the other just said if they're physiologically aroused. So listen to me, in rough times, stay calm. Do not lose your head. Do not blow your top, as they say. Talk about it like two reasonable adults. Work it out like reasonable people. Work it out and solve your problems like a couple who are in love and want their relationship to grow to mature, to bloom, and to bear fruit. Number three, commitment. Commitment comes when the storms of life begin to blow and things aren't going as so well. They're not doing, they're not going the way that you predicted it, that you imagined it, that you wanted it to go. In fact, it's going the opposite direction. In those times when your spouse seems irritated or easily irritated, the same hostile even, the same emotionally distant. Never let the fear of your relationship ending or you ending your relationship ever come into your mind. Remind yourself that your spouse is the best thing that you've ever found. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. So you hold on to your good thing. You never let your good thing go. You'd be like Jacob who wrestled with the man all night and he would not let him go until he blessed him. He wrestled with the angel of the Lord all night and he held on. No matter what, the angel of the Lord even touched his hip and put it out of socket and Jacob could not walk properly on that hip from that day forward, but he would not let it go because he loved sacrificially and he held on and he got his blessing. So we must do no less. We must hold on to the good thing that the Lord has given us. Come here, good thing. Let me hold on to you. You never begin to compare what you have with what you could have had or what you perceive that you could have had, but instead appreciate what God has given you and all the things that you both have achieved and all that you have contributed to your relationship and how you've made your relationship work. Be appreciative and be grateful for those things. Be appreciative of your spouse. Love your spouse. Remind yourself that you are highly blessed by the Lord for giving you a spouse like the one you have. 
Tell yourself that this is our journey, not his or her journey, but our journey. We must walk it together in order to get through it. Nurture gratitude in your heart. Nurture thanksgiving in your heart. My husband, my wife, is the love of my life. I would be lost without him. I would be lost without her. That is a commitment that builds strong loyalty to each other and establishes strong relationships. While on the other hand, if you let negative comparisons come into play, whether in your head or in your speech, this will only breed a feeling of betrayal, which leads to disillusion. Husbands, make sure you create, nurture, and maintain a safe place that whatever is said does not come back to bite the other in a later disagreement. Leave the past in the past and do not revisit it. Leave it behind and be like Lot and his family. Do not look back, but press on ahead. That is what God did for us. God said that <clears throat> he separated us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. So has he separated us from our sins. And God does not look back. He does not bring back into account our past sins. But he has thrown them in the sea of forgetfulness. So if God has done that, that great thing for us, can we do any less with these little things for each other? Our last point, Paul reiterated in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. He says, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is a mutual command with a mutual benefit. These two work in tandem with each other. Husbands, do you feel like you're not being respected? Well, take a look at your wife's love gauge, the gauge that monitors her love tank. Look at it, monitor, is it full? Or is it empty? Or is it somewhere in between? That little gauge should always be on full or bordering full. It should never be half and never ever below half, but always on full or bordering full. If men want respectful wives, they must first be loving husbands and wives. If you want loving husbands, you must submit to your husband. It goes hand in hand. A loving husband, a respectful wife. A respectful wife, a loving husband. It goes hand in hand. This does not mean that we husbands lord it over our wives. Our wives hold husbands for ransom. No, no. It says we work together to achieve one goal. Mutual benefits. It matters to both of us. We both benefit from it. All household decisions must be made mutually, must be beneficial to both. Matter of fact, it should be, all household decisions should be beneficial to everyone involved, the whole family. Everyone should benefit. It should be mutual, beneficial to everyone in the family. So keep this in mind. And again, if, hus if wives aren't respecting you the way that you want them to, or the way you expect them to, or the way you need them to, then fill up her love tank with good, clean, un 
unconditional love and she will respect you. Love her the way she needs to be loved and she will respect you the way that you need to be respected. You don't want your marriage to be like the woman who said, I can, I can remember when I got married. I can remember where I got married, but for the life of me, I cannot remember why I got married. You want to them to remember the when, the where, and the why. You want them to remember the whole thing, the whole kit and caboodle, because you want to make it good. You want to make it pleasing. You want to make it the best thing that she's ever done in her life outside of accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. And speaking of our Lord and Savior, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? You must realize that the picture of marriage is the picture of Jesus and his church. It is a profound mystery, Paul tells us. So it, it, it's a reflection of Jesus and his church that our marriage must be a reflection of perfection. A marriage cannot be an abomination to the Lord. It is not filled with hate. It's not filled with arguments. It's not filled with mistrust. But it is instead filled with love. It is filled with appreciation. It is filled with mutual respect. We love and respect each other. We are to reflect Jesus in our marriage. And if Jesus will not join himself to a certain thing or allow a certain thing in his church, neither should we allow it in our marriages. If it's an abomination to God, it's an abomination to us. If it's unacceptable to Jesus in his church, it's unacceptable to us in our marriages. So husbands, remember this. A happy wife, a happy life. A happy spouse, a happy house. So keep her happy and you'll all be happy. Enjoy your Valentine's Day. Make it a mutually enjoyable day and make it a mutually enjoyable night. But before I go, I always want to give you the opportunity. Those of you who do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want to give you the opportunity to accept him as Lord and Savior. And if you want to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, here's how. Repent of your sins. Say this prayer with me. Just repeat it. Believe it in your heart. Mean it in your heart. And Jesus will forgive you of your sins. Say this. Our Father... Forgive me of my sins. I have sinned against you. I have strayed far from you. Forgive me now, O oh Lord. Forgive me and help me to live for you. Help me to love you. Help me to love my spouse. And O oh Lord God, help me to do the things that you've called me to do. And I'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And if you are looking for a spouse, if you're looking for a husband, if you're looking for a wife, I want to pray this prayer for you. Oh, Lord God, I pray that you bring forth that, 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 that man or that woman that you have for your son, for your daughter. I'm asking you, O oh Lord God, to, to help them to see, to find that good thing. I pray your blessings upon them and that they would know when they see. Build up that love in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Valentine's Day. The Lord bless you richly. We love you. The Lord loves you. Be blessed and stay blessed.